you guys to try. Uh, we have pale, pale malted barley, that's the lighter colored one. I think that one tastes a lot like the cereal grape nuts, if you've ever had that before. And then we have our chocolate malted barley, which kind of more tastes like coffee to me. Um, but yeah, so we have these couple these couple barleys going around. I don't know if you guys were lucky enough to see the silos out front. Those are our grain silos where all that barley is. So we take that barley and we put it into this uh, giant box up on the wall. That is called a grist mill, G-R-I-S-T. Uh, basically, that's a series of rollers, pulverizers, crushers that kind of rip the husks off that barley and expose all the starches, creating a substance called gris, hence the name gris mill. Uh, so we take that gris and you'll see that tube go down into that first kettle in the corner over there. That kettle is called a mash tun. Um, so that, that grist is going to mix with a couple thousand gallons of 150 degree water um, where it creates a substance called mash. It's going to be similar to a substance that it's, it's similar to how oatmeal looks. Um, so we take that mash and we take it, we put it into this kettle right here, our largest kettle on the brew deck. Uh, that is called the Louder Ton. Louder Ton is basically a giant mechanical stainless steel coffee filter. Uh, so that's gonna, uh, it goes in there and sits on top of a false bottom and it drains out, all that liquid drains out, creating a substance called warp. Uh, and then we're left on top with a substance called spent grain. But before we do anything, we go through a simple process called sparging. Basically, it's where we hit that grain with even more water uh, to extract as much fermentable sugar as possible from that grain. So at the end of that pro the sparging process, once again, we're left with that uh, substance called spent grain. Uh, there's nothing really wrong with the spent grain. It's just that we have no, uh, no reason for it left in the brewing process. So what we do is we take that and we uh, feed it to two different animals. Do you guys have any guess what those animals might be? Pigs. Not chickens. Pigs. Not pigs. Cows. Cows, yeah. We have a relationship with the dairy farm out in Western Mass. Uh, it's called Milky Way Farms. It's a pretty adorable name. Um, apparently it makes the cows about 20% more efficient. I don't know if that means they make ice cream instead of milk, but uh, they do like it and we like giving it to them, so we keep that relationship going. We also feed it to another animal. You guys know what it is? Horses. Not horses. Pigeons. Pigeons? I'm sure they would eat it. They eat trash, so, uh, but no. <laughs> so, uh, no, it's not pigeons. Looking at a couple of them. Humans, yeah, exactly. Party animals. Uh, so no, they. Uh, if you guys have ever had any of our uh, pretzels in the beer hall, those are actually made with our spent grain. A little bit on that. We also, wherever that recipe calls for IP, I mean for water, we replace it with Harpoon IPA. Because if you're not going to drink our beer, you're probably going to end up eating our beer here at Harpoon. So. We also put any beer that we use in any of our sauces for the pretzels. Those also have a beer in them as well. So back to the actual beer process. So we're left with that super sweet uh, liquidy substance at the bottom after that sparging process called wort. Wort's going to be the base for our brew. So we take that wort and we put it into this kettle right here, which is called a boil kettle. Pretty self-explanatory what you do in a boil kettle, right guys? Freeze it. No, you boil it, uh, and we boil it uh, at standard boil time is about 90 minutes at 212 degrees. But we here at Harpoon are lucky enough to be one of a handful of brewers that have one of these guys up top here. That little contraption is called a pressurizer. It allows us to boil under pressure, cutting our boil time down by 20 minutes to a nice 70 minutes. Uh, I don't know if you guys, yeah, I'm assuming you've all tried to boil a pot of pasta before. You understand it takes like 10 minutes to actually get that going. So imagine multiplying that little pot by a couple thousand times. Imagine how energy intensive that is. So that extra 20 minutes cuts down on our electric bill more or less. An immense amount cuts down on our carbon footprint. Uh, but most importantly, what we do in the boil kettle here is we add uh, my favorite ingredient, hops. Uh, Mike's going to pass around a couple of pelletized hops. We have Equinox and Cascade hops for you guys to smell. Snack time is over unless you're really, really brave, but I would encourage you not to do that. These are an intense bittering agent used to cut out that super sweetness of the wort. Um, so, yeah, once we add the hops, we go into this kettle right here, which is called the Whirlpool. Pretty self-explanatory once again what we do in the whirlpool hand gestures and courage we spin it around uh, so that wart's going to come in at a tangent create a natural whirlpool uh, and it creates a sea foam cloud-like substance called true true is basically a bunch of byproducts that are left over from the boil uh, we pull that out uh, but a lot of home brewers will keep that in their beer we pull it out for, for filtration reasons down the line but most importantly what you do with the whirlpool is you add your junk ingredients to your beer 
So have you guys ever had our UFO white before? That is our orange peel and coriander, our unfiltered wheat beer made with orange peel and coriander. Mike just passed around some orange peel and coriander, which we uh, put in the Whirlpool. Snack time's over once again, unless you enjoy eating potpourri. That's basically what that's gonna taste like. Uh, but yeah, we basically put it in here and it steeps it and we get those flavors in there. This is where we also introduced our, say, our cinnamon and nutmeg for our winter warmer if you had that. Uh, but last but, not la last but not least, before we can go into the actual fermentation process and introduce yeast, we have to cool down that wort to a nice, like about 70 degrees. We do this with a process called the knockout. Basically, we send this wort out to our fermentation tanks uh, with a thin sheet of metal, thin sheet of metal, and then there's another pipe with cold water coming back the opposite direction. That creates a natural heat exchange where that wort is gonna get cooled down to that about 70 degrees, but then that cold water is gonna get heated up again by that wort to about 150 degrees, which if you guys are paying attention is the perfect temperature for our mashing process. So that cuts down our carbon footprint as well. So I'm gonna head down to the cellars with a pitcher and Mike's gonna tell you about fermentation. All right, Rob, don't get lost down there. All right, cool, we'll see Rob in just a little bit. I'm gonna run through that fermentation process, finish this off for you guys, and then we'll get to taste a little bit of beer. We gotta finish this off. Uh, so we're pumping that wort into those fermentation tanks. The two uh, rows are right on the right-hand side of you guys, around the top tank, and then on the back side of the brewery as well. There's a lot more of these, because this process takes a little bit longer. Fermentation is gonna take about three to four days, maybe a fifth day, uh, but there's 300 pounds of yeast waiting in there for that wort to be pumped in. And once it does, yeast just goes to town on all the sugars, kind of like Thanksgiving dinner, basically. They eat all the sugars that during fermentation, if you remember chemistry class from long ago, converts it to two major byproducts, alcohol and CO2. A third of the CO2 that we have in the final product, we are gonna force carbonate our beers uh, before we get them packaged up and everything, because uh, CO2 is kind of the best vessel, or one of the best vessels to get all its flavors and aromas out. Uh, the bubbles uh, you know, kind of pop on your palate, uh, in your nose, and uh, enhance your beer drinking experience with all those aromas. All right, so um, fermentation again, three to four days. This is the first time we can call this beer. It's no longer wort, it is now beer, but we call it green beer at this stage. Not because it's green in color, not say patch state beer or anything like that. Uh, it's just kind of super fresh. It's kind of immature in a sense. And there's a few more stages of conditioning before it's a nice mature beer and call a finished product and actually serve it to you guys. So again, conditioning comes next, another seven to 10 days. to let all those flavors develop, uh, just take kind of let it all settle out and produce all the flavors and aromas that we want from your beer. Um, so another week we can have, we actually cool down that wort down to, excuse me, it's not wort, it is beer now. Uh, we cool down to 29 degrees, all those fermentation tanks coated with glycol jackets around the outside. Crash cools the beer down to 29 degrees uh, and then let it sit in that conditioning phase. Uh, we could dry hop the beer again at this point as well, just directly ejecting more hops, uh, pelletized as well, uh, to add some more flavors and more aromas. Now there are two steps of filtration. Bear with me guys, I know we're getting uh, kind of bored here with the science stuff, but uh, two steps of filtration. The first step all our beers are gonna go through. Uh, the first one is the centrifuge, just kind of the same thing as the whirlpool over here, but a lot more intensely. Whips that beer around in a circular fashion really, really quickly. Push all the solids that we don't want out to the side that we then first would filter off. The UFO beers stop after this step of filtration because they don't go through the second step of filtration. They have a characteristic haze to them that's typical of that style of beer as well. Um, gives them a different mouthfeel, a different look, they kind of got a hazy look to them. Um, they get forced carbonated at this point and then packaged up for you guys to consume. The rest of our beers go through the second step of filtration called the diatomaceous earth filter or the DE filter for short. Fossilized algae has been ground up to very fine, fine powder. It's just poor, so it's gonna strain the beer through it basically, take out all the really small solids at the one micron in size. So scientific talk, super, super small. Get a nice, clear, crisp product after that. It's called Bright Beer now. This night's kind of bright in color. Um, we put in a Bright Beer tank, just a storage tank basically, um, before it gets packaged up. Again, force carbonate using carbonation stones to add the rest of the bubbles that we need. And then we put in bottles of cans and kegs and ship off for you guys to consume. Speaking of, are we ready to do so? Guys ready to drink some beer? All right, awesome. You can head back into the tasting room. Rob should have a sample glass on the bar. Grab one of those sample glasses, hang on to it. Keep your safety on as well. What you get from there? Uh, for your beer, um, it's not your lunch or anything like that. It is hot solid um, that we're going to filter out to get this nice clear product on the right beer at the end. Also, if you notice anything else, I don't even have to spin these around. But I spin these around. Yeah. yeah. No, so I can spin this probably all day and just get some sad bubbles. This one got a nice head retention. All the bubbles that we need. It's been forced carbonated. Um, got a lot more aroma off there as well. You might notice some muted flavors coming off here. 
Um, also, the flavors in your mouth as well. It might just kind of be straight bitterness. Um, and that's also because, well, I'm holding the bowl so I can tell, but there is a difference in temperature between beer. You normally used to drink in this final product on all the top between 30 and 42 degrees. Uh, Rob is just kind enough to pull this green beer for you guys right off the tank in the cellar, and it's sitting at 29 degrees. And that really cold temperature kind of shocks your taste buds a little bit, doesn't allow um, you to get the full uh, drinking experience. So, uh, an increase in temperature allows a little bit more of that flavor and aroma to develop, even a better beer drinking. What year you did it? 29 downstairs. Um, so that's for that conditioning phase. Again, we cook the tanks in glycol jackets, crash cool it down there um, so it can condition and um, let all those flavors develop and then we'll warm it up afterwards. Um, there might be other reasons, I'm not exactly sure, but kind of keeping it cool. Uh, also, since the yeast cells in hibernation as well, um, so that's part of it. Um, we don't want them to overeat. There's fermentable and non fermentable sugars. We don't want them to start eating non fermentable sugars. So we can go through the loss of that one. Cut the subreads for now. We're gonna get to the fun part. Uh, we got 12 taps for you guys to try your little sample glasses, your tool for the game. We're gonna run you through the house rules. Uh, it's called Drink the Beer. It's super fun. You're all winners. You're gonna sample all these beers that we have on tap. So come up, point your whisper, what you'd like to try. I'll start pouring for you guys. Uh, it's only two ounce samples, so we want you guys to step outside your comfort zone. It's uh, not a pint. It's just again a little two ounces. If you really don't like what you get, I'll dump down the drink, get you something that you do like. Uh, but we do again want you to try something a little bit different. Rob's going to give you a tap talk, so again, while he's doing so, come up and point and whisper what you like to try. Most creepy voice, since it is uh, all you right around the corner, so it's very most creepy voice. But we just kind of ask you to keep your voices down, uh, keep all those side conversations and questions. And so Rob's uh, talking with his tap talk, we're not mic'd up in here. There's about 20 of you guys, and only one of him, um, so we'll save a whole...